History's full of terrible kings and queens. The Roman emperors alone could have filled this list. Some kings had their ability to cause significant harm reduced, including the narcissistic prince regent, the self-centered Edward VIII. We're not saying all of them were bad, but there have been some that deserve to be in the top eight for the terrible way they've ruled, and we're going to talk about them in this video. First up, at number eight, we have Gaius Caligula. Caligula's crazed rule sets a high bar. After a promising start to his reign, Caligula humiliated and terrified the Senate and the Army's senior command. He also caused great offense by claiming to be God, especially in Jerusalem, as even the Romans only recognized deification after death. It was also commonly believed that he indulged in incest with his sisters and led a life of sexual debauchery. And this may very well be true. Caligula made the mistake of endangering Rome's military reputation by declaring a kind of absurd sea war, ordering his soldiers to wade in and slay at the waves with their swords. They had to collect chests full of seashells as the spoils of his victory over the god Neptune, king of the sea. He also made this mistake by declaring himself victorious for his unsuccessful campaign against the Germans, despite it being a failure. In AD 41, the Praetorian Guard murdered him. Claudius, Caligula's successor, wasn't a significant upgrade either. At number 7, we have Pope John XII. John XII was a disastrous ruler, even by the lax standards of the medieval pope. In exchange for political favors from the Roman nobility, he was appointed pope at 18, taking office during a power struggle between the papacy and the Italian monarch Berengarius over sovereignty of Italy. Otto I, the strong German emperor, vowed to protect John's right to rule, but John was too preoccupied with his life of wild sex parties in the Lateran to give any thought to the matter. He took Otto's word of eternal service and conspired with Otto's adversary, Berengarius. Otto had John removed as pope and replaced him with Leo VIII after accusing him of simony, murder, perjury, and incest, among other things. John, on the other hand, staged a comeback and brutally punished Leo's supporters. Between John and Otto, a full-fledged war broke out until John suddenly passed away. Supposedly, it had happened while in bed with another man's wife. Next up, at number six, we have King John. The reign of King John serves as a helpful reminder that incompetence in a ruler cannot be overlooked. John was Henry II's favorite and youngest son, yet he was mockingly referred to as John Lackland because he hadn't been given any estates. He made an unsuccessful attempt to gain control when his brother Richard I was gone on a crusade, and after Richard's return, he was exiled. As soon as he assumed the throne, John had his own nephew Arthur assassinated out of concern that Arthur may attempt to establish his own superior claim to the throne. He then engaged in a disastrous war with King Philippe Auguste of France in which he lost all of Normandy. The barons lost a significant portion of their power base as a result of this, and he further alienated them by making irrational demands for money. He even coerced them into giving him access to their wives. They compelled him to accept the Magna Carta out of frustration, but as soon as he sealed it, he broke his promise and sent the nation into a civil war and French invasion. History has helped other dictators gain redemption, but not John. At number five, we have King Richard II. Richard II has excellent reason to be thankful to Shakespeare, as opposed to Richard III, who showed this unfit monarch as a tragic figure, a victim of events and the whims of others, rather than the conceited, self-centered author of his own downfall he truly was. Richard II alienated the nobility by assembling a group of cronies around him and then found himself in conflict with Parliament over his financial demands, showing that he hadn't learned from the tragic example set by Edward II. Before declining into a bloody vendetta between Richard and the five lords of Pellant, whom he either had slain or exiled, his reign first deteriorated into a game of political maneuvering between himself and his far more capable and impressive uncle, John of Gaunt. He could have saved face by military or administrative prowess, but he lacked both. Even though it was undoubtedly illegal, Henry Bolingbroke's coup in 1399 ended Richard's dismal reign. Moving on, at number four, we have Ivan IV, the Terrible. Prince Ivan Vasilievich was raised in the dangerous court of Moscow, where the rivalry of the boyars, or no frequently put his life in jeopardy. He developed a lifelong hate of the nobility as a result, and at 13, he had one boyer devoured alive by dogs. Ivan was the first person to be crowned Tsar of all Russia in 1547. He had been Prince of Moscow since 1533. He killed the boyers and stole their territories to distribute them to his own supporters. He also sentenced millions of Russians to live as serfs forever. Ivan claimed a sizable portion of Russia as his own, patrolled by a mounted police force with full authority to make arrests and carry out any 
executions they pleased. Because he didn't trust Novgorod, he had it forcefully taken over and its citizens killed. He then started a series of destructive and ultimately fruitless wars with Russia's neighbors. Ivan killed his son in a fit of rage while beating up his own pregnant daughter-in-law. Safe to say, he was controlled by bloodlust and paranoia. At number three, we have Mary, Queen of Scots. It's simple to overlook the glaringly obvious fact that Mary, Queen of Scots, was completely useless as a Queen of Scotland because we're so familiar with the drama and tragedy of her reign. It's true that governing Scotland in the 16th century wasn't simple, and Mary's job was made even more difficult by the strict Presbyterian leader John Knox and her violent, obnoxious husband, Lord Darnley. However, Mary lacked Elizabeth I's political shrewdness in resolving theological or factional disputes, and instead chose to engage Knox and the Presbyterians in a fruitless argument. She played into the stereotype by appearing to live in a cozy world of favorites, including her unhappy Italian guitar teacher, David Rizzio, at a period when female rule was already universally viewed with distrust. Mary made a huge mistake. She was thought to have been involved in the dramatic murder of Darnley on February 10, 1567. Three months later, she married the Earl of Bothwell, the primary suspect, which was really stupid. It should come as no surprise that the Scots deposed Mary and imprisoned her. After making her getaway, she made the mistake of traveling to England, where she was seen as a threat, rather than France, where she would have been greeted with open arms. At number two, we have Emperor Rudolf II. Rudolf, by any measure, was a terrible leader. Although he was a victim of episodes of severe depression and spent most of his time delving in astronomy and alchemy, he was chosen to be the Holy Roman Emperor in 1576. Rudolf, a devout Catholic, tore up the religious agreement that had prevented Catholics and Protestants in Germany from clashing for the previous 20 years and launched a mission to drive Protestantism out of Germany's towns and villages. Rudolf isolated himself in Prague Castle and remained silent when the Protestants organized a self-defense league. The Hungarians revolted and the Turks launched an invasion. Eventually, the Habsburgs had to consent to Matthias, Rudolf's brother, taking over as ruler. Matthias was able to bring back religious harmony in Germany and negotiate treaties with the Turks and Hungarians, but Rudolf later lost control and restarted the Turkish war. He reluctantly agreed to sign the Letter of Majesty, guaranteeing Protestants in Bohemia freedom of worship, but he soon started a persecution campaign. Matthias received a request for assistance from the Bohemians, and in 1611, Rudolf was compelled to cede control to his brother. He died only a year later, having contributed to the tragic Thirty Years' War, which broke apart Europe six years after his passing. Finally, at number one, we have Queen Rana Valona I of Madagascar. Queen Rana Valona managed to keep Madagascar independent of British and French rule during a time when Europeans were expanding their colonial holdings throughout the world. But she did so by enforcing a rule that was so brutal that it said that the population of her kingdom was cut in half during her rule. In order to keep the Malagasy army loyal and the rest of the population from paying taxes, Queen Rana Valona subjected them to repeated periods of forced labor. In one infamous occasion, she organized a buffalo hunt for herself, her nobles, and their families, as well as for their supporters. She insisted that a full road be built in front of the party, and estimated 10,000 people perished carrying out this particular act of folly. As she became more paranoid due to the many conspiracies and at least one genuine coup attempt, Queen Rana Valona made more individuals endure the infamous Tangina test, which involved eating three pieces of chicken skin, followed by ingesting a toxic nut that made the subject throw up. The victim was put to death if none of the three pieces were discovered in the vomit. Initially encouraging Christianity, Queen Rana Valona altered her position and began the violent persecution of indigenous Christians. She escaped every attempt to harm her and passed away in her bed. That's all for this video. Which monarch do you think was the worst? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel for more exciting content in the future. Thanks for watching and see you next time.